where we're like, scrap, oh, scrap the interview. Let's just talk and figure out. This. Okay. Because like corporate rehab, I'm like corporate rehab, what a great name. And then from there, it was just, we're going to start doing everything together. Yes. And that was that. Yes. So it was love it alone. And then we never left each other's side. <laughs> so you can introduce yourself because the introduction took me three hours before we hung up the phone, so I better not go there. Okay, corporate rehab. I mean, you could just imagine how fabulous that was. And I said, well, corporate rehab, I'm going into corporate reimagination, so how are we going to go from here? And so. So, yes. Well, thank you for having me, Shelly, because I'm so excited to be here and with the Female Quotient and everyone. So Corporate Rehab is a leadership company and movement that I founded when I left my corporate job and decided that I needed a process to detox from the hustle culture that I found <laughs> myself caught up in. And I started to document uh, a little bit of my own story and started to ask a couple of other friends what their experiences were, and the stories started pouring in. And so I decided that I would actually start to make this a little bit more formal and begin a leadership company that really trains executive women how to get to the next level within their career without losing themselves in the process. And as part of that, uh, we decided to put together a book because we had so many stories um, and it was really uh, such a shame to leave those stories in the dark where they had been for so long. I had women calling me and saying, I haven't told anybody this story, but you have to hear what happened to me. And so that's really what happened. And the book launches tomorrow. So we're so excited. Yay. Um, and I am really lucky enough to have two of the women that I interviewed here along with me to talk about their own stories of corporate rehab. Okay. So before we go there, the you start, how many stories did you capture in your book? 300. 300 stories of women that left the workplace because they just couldn't take it anymore which is so incredibly sad. And, you know, we talk about the great resignation, so many women in particular leaving, and you wrote this book in 2020, you started? I started in 2020, yes. So it's been about a year and a half-ish. Yep. So pandemic, which is really quite remarkable. And just for the record, what was it that, you know, in your corporate life that made you just finally say, I've had it? So there are probably a couple of things, um, if I'm honest with myself, which I'm trying to be very much in the book and being vulnerable. Um, it was a, this little voice inside me for 10 years that said, I don't know that I'm really supposed to be doing this, um, but, I, but I'm getting all the success from it. And really the breaking point came from the pandemic actually making me stop and just listen to that voice that I tried to run from or drown out. And so the final breaking point was, um, we were having all this time inside the house together. My husband's here. My two kids were having uh, school, elementary school at the kitchen table. And I turned to my son and I said, I know it's the pandemic and it's so hard, but we've got all this family time that we've now, you know, rediscovered. And he said, yeah, it's great on the weekends. You're on Zoom for 14 hours, but I get to see you on Saturday and Sunday. And that was really what did it. Something inside me kind of snapped that said, okay, I'm trying to pretend that this is the life that I'm doing for my kids, but nobody's having fun. And that's really what started this whole process of saying, how did I get here? And really, how can I help other women who are trying to navigate that process for themselves? Okay, then. There you have it. The snap. <laughs> <laughs> what was the snap for me? First, introduce yourself. Well, my name is Pavi Dinamani. I have my own video agency. We basically are a full service video marketing agency called Misfit Communications. The term Misfit essentially came from this snap moment where I always felt like a misfit. I've been in corporate for about 10 years as a chemical engineer. And um, the snap happened and I moved into video and video marketing. And now I give visibility to women, the women whose stories aren't told, uh, the women that need to influence the future female leaders and kind of create change that way. So my snap, my snap was different. <laughs> Look at everyone's heads. The bobble heads. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Whatever your superpower is, that's what I put on video. I make sure that that's highlighted and that's, that's the thing I do. But yeah, my, my snap moment was uh, a little different. I'd say for me, it was more um, as an immigrant and as a, a child of immigrants, because I, I was, I'm Indian, I was raised in the Middle East, and then I moved here for college, so I'm a double immigrant, if that's a, if that's a word. 
Um, the one thing that happens, and I don't know if many people in the audience know, it's very, very hard to get a work visa sponsored by your company. And it takes a lot to find a company that will sponsor you. And then the type of work you do also has to be in your field of study. So you don't have too much flexibility to leave. So you're kind of in your own you know, you're stuck. At the same time, if you're having a good time enjoying your work, that's great. But at the same time, you cannot do a side job. You can't um, even volunteering. There's a lot of things, there are legalities around it. So I felt stuck, but I kind of came to peace with that thinking, okay, this is what I need to do. I'm going to stay an engineer. I'm good at it. It's fine. But I think the biggest moment for me when I felt like I can't do this is I had no visibility to any other form of leadership because I was in oil and gas, which is very, very typical um, type A personality. It's usually male dominated. You have to be aggressive. You're networking. You're you know, you're playing golf and eating steak and doing things that I don't do any of those things. You do football and I don't football. Like, I don't know any of those things. So um, it just was one path and there was no visibility to another path. And I felt like that's when I was ready to, to make a change. Wow. Snap, stuck, <laughs> snore, <Yeah>. and steak. <laughs> I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're stuck in the stuck? seat under the air conditioning, which oh, no, seems no. to never work with the microphones. I can try this we one. We figured oh, that there out today. Oh, <laughs> teamwork. Sharing is caring. Thank you. Um, my name is Jamie Ellis. I am a former B2B technology marketing executive turned entrepreneur and executive coach. So I specialize mainly in career transitions, partly because I went through a couple of really hefty career transitions over the last few years. Um, like these women, I hit a stage of burnout back in 2019 and decided to redesign my life. My snap was not a precise moment, but I don't know if anyone in here can relate. I started having these unspoken fantasies. So I fantasized about getting fired and I really wanted it to happen because I wanted that decision to be made for me. I fantasized about catching somebody doing something wrong so I could have power over them. I've talked to a lot of women who have had fantasies about having a short hospital stay so that they had a justification for taking a break from work. And all of these things are this little voice in the back of my head that are a fleeting thought. And I was like, why do I keep having these nasty thoughts? And it was because my body and my mind were trying to find a way to reconcile and to signal to me that it was over. Wow. Okay. So the snap got us either to stay at home, write a book, or become an entrepreneur. So. Then we meet, and I'm like, gosh, you know, I started my own company so that, and the female quotient, and now I said, you're like writing the book to do the entrepreneur, and we're starting this whole concept called the flipping point to rewrite the rules in the workplace to encourage women to stay and to get CEOs to rewrite the rules so that all of us could thrive and not leave the corporate world, which is what we're doing now. So we've got to partner because we want women to stay in the workplace and thrive and to rewrite the rules, which is why I'm the chief troublemaker, because we don't want to leave. <laughs> we want to stay. And why should we have to run? We want to actually rise and become the leaders to become the CEOs to rewrite the rules. So that's what we're about to do. So let's talk about the, the case studies, some of the things that you found and some of the things that you would now do to avoid the snap? And if we were rewriting the rules, what would they be? So let's go there. Sure, I can start with that. Um, I think the first thing just to think about if I were doing it over again is really, you know, hitting on something that Jamie said, is really tuning into my body. Um, some of the stories you asked about, yeah. these stories were just insane. To, I, I would sometimes have to decompress from what I had just heard. Um, one of them uh, was a woman who said, you know, I really knew I was flying away from my kids and I didn't want to do that, but I had this, you know, at the, the next promotion was within my grasp and I had to fly to another country for 24 hours and come back and I missed my two-year-old's birthday and I wasn't sure, you know, whether this was really in it for me, but I just thought I would stick it out. And I said, well, was there something in your body, you know, any type of physical manifestation of the stress? Because I started hearing these stories. And she thought and she said, actually, you know, I did start throwing up, but I noticed it was only 
Monday through Friday. And I thought that was a little strange. And I thought, what? That is strange. Well, how long did this go on? And she said, for 18 months. So she threw up for a year and a half before she decided, maybe it's the job that's really getting to me. And I heard story after story of our bodies really trapping the stress and trying to get through to us in some way. One woman's hair started falling out. Someone else was rushed to the emergency room thinking she was having a heart attack and her her doctor said, there's nothing wrong with you. You have workplace stress that is, is leading you to burnout. So I think that's the first thing of just tuning into what's happening in your body. But then to your point, why are we in these situations where we've got either cultures or productivity demands that are forcing us to operate like machines when we're humans? And I think that piece is so important to me to have this partnership where we're looking at within corporate rehab, what can you do as a leader to change any of the mindsets and the patterns within yourself? But then we're calling on corporate America to say, what are you doing as leaders, as executives of these companies to rewrite those rules and make it so that people don't come to a point where they're hitting this burnout. So, And so I want to spend the rest of the time for that because I, I, I think anyone, man or woman, that chooses the entrep entrepreneurial pathway is wonderful. But I don't believe we should have to, by default, mm -hmm. choose that because we are running from something. So I love the partnership because we've been there, done that. And as a serial entrepreneur, when I knew I wanted to be a great mom and a great CEO, I had a choice. Either one, leave the workforce as I knew it, or two, rise the ranks and choose a family or a CEO mm -hmm. career or three, create my own company to be CEO of and write my own rules, which is what I did. Mm -hmm. So today I decided we are going to, based on everything we know, write the new rules of Fortune 500 so that we can all thrive. I love so it. So that we can do corporate rehab mm -hmm. So that we can all, men and women, thrive with our experiences. Right. So we have choice. Be an entrepreneur if you choose, but be a successful person in, in the corporate world. So if you were now today, write the new rules, what would they be knowing what you know? Let's go. For me, I think the the biggest rule would be, which I think is very common to a lot of women, women of color, is financial literacy. That was one thing that I was always afraid of, and I believe a lot of women are afraid. They don't, they feel stuck, whatever their situation. I wish a lot of women knew that. That would empower them. So financial abuse is real. Financial safety is real. Those are things that we can start small and feel safe so that way that is not a decision factor for us to decide to leave or not leave things like that but uh the biggest thing that worked for me was the fact that whatever position you are in your work whatever phase you are whether you're about to quit or you haven't quit or you're chugging along you're having the best time at your job the important thing is to market yourself create a strong personal brand and be visible have a plan to get yourself out there no matter what stage you're in because you never know who's watching your content reading what you're putting out there um, i've developed mentor mentee relationships through that i have um, gotten offers job offers through that and that should be at every stage be visible you are a marketable commodity you don't need to wait till you either quit or leave or um, are laid off i feel like market yourself in advance it's it's gonna help is that what you're doing in your new company today doing profiling for women yes so right now what we do is basically we created this new offering called a leader bio video the leader is spelled with an h in there for her um so it's lead her so that we can elevate future female leaders and of course um it's essentially a video bio a resume sort of thing for women to talk about their personal and professional lives and 
let people know what got them there professionally as well as personally because even when you see your company leadership, you usually don't hear about the women or you don't see them, you don't know what they look like. Um, they're necessarily not hanging out after work doing the things that all the other people do. This is what we created to give women a level playing field through the pandemic, especially because women were disproportionately affected. Great. So come to our lounges and start doing those in all of our lounges. We bring visibility to all of our yeah. women. We would love that. My co-founder is like, yes, let's do this. <laughs> done, done and dusted. Done. Let's go. What else? New for rules sure. in the workplace. Let's New go. New rules in the workplace. So um, I didn't mention this when I introduced myself, but I'm also in the process of writing a book. And there's a concept that came out of my book that I dubbed achievement dysmorphia. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's our brain misconstruing the reality of our successes. So it shrinks everything that we've done. So when we look forward to the future, it thinks that we're only capable of this much because that's what we've told ourselves we've done. So my rule is to look backwards frequently because we forget how far we've come. We're so focused on the future. We're so focused on our goals that we forget to remind ourselves, oh, we climbed all these mountains. So as we're looking forward, the possibilities are endless because we've been able to do all that. I'd like to add just a couple of things to that too. Just when we think about it at the CEO level, I think one of the things that are going to be really important as we look for the, the new rules that we're writing is really to balance the traditionally masculine power with feminine power. And by that, I mean, we have both of those within all of us, regardless of you know gender. It really comes down to masculine is typically associated with driving and dominance and achieving and producing. Feminine is associated with compassion and empathy and collaboration and nurturing, and both are needed in the boardroom. And I think that's one of the things that I see within corporate America, the rules that are, are, are really harmful, the stories that I heard that were the worst, those leaders were very much overdriving in masculine power. A lot of times they'll call it the wounded masculine, where you're only as good as your last deal, and productivity is the only thing that matters. And yes, it's a balanced scorecard, but revenue is the only thing that we actually reward or, or we, we really, you know, uh, value caring, but the asshole that's the rainmaker, we're going to give him a pass. It's that type of behavior um, that we really need to change just as an overarching, um, you know, guidance, I think. And then within that, I think you can actually carve out a couple of rules around productivity needs to be balanced with impact and what you're doing to actually collaborate across the team versus individual metrics. I think those types of things are all the items that need to change moving forward. But even the woman that threw up for 18 months, you know, think about that. You know, if you had, you know, and I, I read this great story about parental leave, if we had equal sharing in the workplace and equal sharing at home, I think that would go a long way too. You know, so I think that the parental policies mm -hmm. would really help a lot, you know, and that is, you know, if caregiving wasn't, um, still predominantly a female responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think, and that's not just what happens at work. I think that negotiation has to happen with partnerships. Right. That could, and that's not necessarily CEO, mm -hmm. but I think the parental leave has to be something very equal. Yes. As well. Yeah. I, in doing some of the research for my book, I, I realized that there's extra 20 hours a week that women in, or traditionally women play in, in a caregiving perspective that the men partnerships in their marriages do not, which if you add that time up, whether that's leisure time or time to devote to, to yourself or children, that adds up, right? So you're adding all of these extra shifts, which already imbalances. Then there's the office housework where that gets carried into the workplace. So I think the caregiving piece is a huge piece. And then the next thing with that is this next generation the dads want to be caregivers too. Like they don't want to have the relationship that they might've had with their own fathers or grandfathers. They want to be there for their kids and they're looking at their job and then they're looking at their breadwinner status if they are the breadwinner and they're saying, I want something different, but how do I do that? And so now I'm actually getting just as many requests from men saying, I want this too. And how do we actually change caregiving to make it not a gendered thing? Um, and when we add in, 
adults with, you know, elderly caregiving and the sandwich generation and young kids, like this is something we're, we're getting to, you know, crisis moment. And I think we need to partly look towards the next generation that says, we want to have more balance in our relationships, whether that's within ourselves, at work, and at home. And we also want more meaning and purpose at work, regardless of gender. And so how do we create workplaces that allow for all of that while still being productive and ambitious and profitable? And I think we have to have men and women talking about that mm -hmm. and saying that and having the men going out of their way saying, I'm going to take my kids to the soccer game. I'm leaving early to take my kids to the soccer game. Yeah. And women saying, I'm leaving early to take my kids, not just the women, mm -hmm. so that women don't feel uncomfortable, so that it's mm -hmm. not a woman thing. Right. And we should say that. Yep. And use the examples. Yep. And we should have pictures of our kids out, men and women. Because who, you know, women felt uncomfortable going to their kids' schools. Mm -hmm. Because they thought they would be the exception. But if men would say that too, on a, I'm going to drive my kids to school. Right. Not as, oh, he's the cute dad doing that once. But we go out <laughs> of our way to do it as parents. Right. And also, when we call it not like um, parental leave, but family leave, mm -hmm. so that people that don't have kids, but everyone has a parent potentially. You right. know, consciousness. Mm -hmm. in a whole new way, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And we reinforce that, you know, things like that. So these are the kinds of things we have to start being way more conscious of. Right. I think that will go a long way as well. And that's the empathy piece. Yes, absolutely. And to your point, telling the stories, I think, is really important. And thinking about the fact that we're now in this multi-generational workforce, you've got people that have a very different perspective of what it meant to be a parent, what they want out of life. Um, a quick story on this that I actually captured for the book, and one of the men that I used to work with when he had his second child, he said, um, you know, I'm supposed to go back out on the road when she was two weeks old, but you've already advocated for yourself. Can you advocate for me too? Because our boss won't listen to me, but can you go in? And so I said, sure. I went in and said, you know, I, we had just had our first son. And so I said, oh, you know, Mike's assigned to this project, but you know, he, they just had a baby. Do you think we can get him something local? And the boss looked at me and said, I really wish we could, but how's he going to pay for college if he doesn't get back out there? She was two weeks old. Like there was plenty of time to save for that, but he was applying this old mindset that helped him, but not making room to your point for what this other person wanted. So I think there's some value in that too, of just not going on autopilot and saying, because I did it this way, you have to too. But giving some room for people to say what they want and then endorsing that decision. I took phone calls when I was six centimeters dilated yeah. <laughs> in the hospital room. Uh, thank you so much. Here's to rewriting the rules in the workplace so that we can all thrive. Thank you. Thank Corporate you, Shelley. Looking forward to this. Thank you.